Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. To all of my returning subscribers, hey, how you doing? And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. Kick your feet up, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you don't miss any posts. Also follow me on Instagram at the same profile name so you can get sneak peeks of what's coming up next. In this video, the recap and review, which gives the spoiler option of the Spike Lee directed film, The Five Bloods. Now, if you missed the trailer reaction, I do have the link in the comments. Since this movie is very graphic, I wanted to give an option for those that weren't ready to see such a violent war movie. So I wanna give you the entire movie with photos, letting you know everything that happened in the movie. But I wanna give my review first. I'll announce spoiler alert, and then I will give you the recap of the entire movie. That's all coming up next. this movie was absolutely wonderful now I said in the trailer the only thing is I predicted that Spike Lee would irritate me with the drawn-out scenes with the violins and the horns that is one thing that gets on my nerves with every Spike Lee movie there are these scenes where I cannot and that but as I predicted in the trailer reaction I think that's just Spike Lee's thing I think that's just what he does so this movie is directed by Spike Lee and of course starring uh, Delroy Lindo we have Jonathan Majors Chadwick Boseman uh, Clark Peters only to name a few the movie gives us an idea once again of the experience of many black soldiers who not only fight for this country but what they return to when coming home when coming to america and it really puts the forefront of things to think about with wars and how black people are treated this movie is extremely graphic so if you are not ready to see something like that i recommend you look at my recap where i don't give you the vulgar details of certain things i don't i'm not gonna put in any vulgar photos within the first few minutes there are real Vietnam photos, bodies, uh, bodies that are mutilated. It's just really, really deep. And I thought I was just going to slowly get into the war information. Uh, but Spike, he just, psh, I mean, he just gives it to you straight on and you see images of people being shot instantly. And I was just like, Whoa, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. When I heard about the movie coming out a while ago, because it's actually been on Netflix for a while, and I thought, oh, that's a war movie. I'm not ready for that because there's so uh, much going on emotionally with the COVID-19, the George Floyd, Floyd situation, the movement, the protesting, and my heart was really heavy. So I was like, oh, I'm, just, I'm just not ready for this film. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna muster it up. The plot seems very interesting. And uh, I started to remember how this is, I started to think, is this correlated with the book that um, I saw a couple of months ago? And I had to prepare my heart and my mind. And I said, okay, here we go. It is a war movie. Here we go, let's go ahead and watch it. So it's very vulgar. And if you're not ready for that, please don't watch it because there's a lot of things that could probably give people trauma. Uh, yeah, it possibly could give people stress and seeing images. I have a very strong photographic memory and once I see it, for days, I can remember it. I actually have to look at doggy videos or, or, or little pandas at the zoo, like anything that's gonna help me get back into my mindset of happy things um, because I do have a very strong photographic memory. Overall, despite the horns that I find very annoying for uh, Spike to do, the acting was phenomenal. So with the cons, of course, the horns, um, Spike Lee, he has those scenes that are so drawn out 
and some scenes can be cut out, some scenes are unnecessary, but the storyline of this movie was very interesting and it kept you glued to your screen because you had no idea of what to expect next. The plot of this movie, without giving anything away, we are under the impression that there are four remaining vets that return to Vietnam searching for one of their colleagues so they can retrieve the body and return it back to the States for a proper burial. Um, we do see in the trailer there are some additional things that are going on and you can predict where it can go, but to watch any further would give you more information and I don't want to say what those things are because that would be a spoiler. Overall, when it comes to acting, the, the, the pros, that the acting was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, uh, going into Jonathan Majors, he is, which I explained in the trailer video, he is a Yale graduate in theater, in the arts. And he's new to film and most people probably don't recognize his face because before that it's a lot of theater and he's just getting into the world of film, whether it be TV based or movies since 2013. So in that year, when it comes to film, you're still considered a bit of a rookie. But when we talk about Clark Peters, I mean, he's absolutely, you know, uh, just amazing. He has a long resume, but he's been in the corner, the wire, and he is just a uh, just phenomenal actor. Delroy Lindo does an amazing job in this movie as well. Great. Um, just Chadwick Boseman, a fool. I mean, he, this, the entire cast is absolutely amazing. The incorporation of a lot of individual individuals um, who, uh, Spike Lee does a wonderful job of bringing faces that we don't know and people that we don't know along with his regulars. A lot of directors have their regulars that they keep on, ro he, they keep on the rotation when it comes to movies. Uh, Scorsese does it, uh, 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 Steven Spielberg, plenty of directors keep the, the, uh, here and there the same actors over and over again and then they introduce and incorporate those fresh new faces that we haven't seen. So bravo performance throughout this entire movie. Also the cinematography in a lot of the shots uh, were great. Spike Lee is starting to do more movies to where there's more action sequences. So even him being in the industry for so long, you can tell that he is still learning. Even though his platform are, his platforms for a lot of movies are political based, cultural based. He tries every now and then to get out of that bubble as much as he can. And you can tell that he really stepped out on this one in to, to try something new. But I bet he said to the rest of the writers, hey, I got to have my horns in this. <laughs> I give this movie a strong uh, eight, 8 out of 10. Reason why it's not a 10 out of 10, not because, not because of the horns, but because there are a lot of scenes uh, that I found that could have been left out. There were moments to where he did the same thing in Black Klansmen when there are monologues going on or key points that they're speaking of, there are flashes of photos. And to me, it gives it that student film feel. And when those photos are introduced, when there's flashes of photos of who the characters are speaking of, it, it, it pulls me out of that element and getting deep into what the actors are doing. That's just like movies that are based in the 40s. And if I hear a current modern day song in the movie, it pulls me out of it. And I'm like, it, 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 it makes me forget that we're in the 40s. I really don't like that. But then again, that is a personal preference. Spike Lee does that and I can't stand when he pops those photos up. It, it really would have made the movie more fluid if the scene just flowed and there weren't any photos. Challenge us to hear that and then as the viewers to go look that up and find out who those people are if we don't know who those people are. But he wants you to know, hey, this is a picture. This is what they look like. This is what they talking about. Here you go. Here's, here's, a, here's a photo. <laughs> and I just don't like that. It's very irritating. Right when I'm in the middle, uh, middle of a scene, here's a photo. And it's like, ah. 
Also, <laughs> Spike has the tendency to pull in those same elements into each movie. The scenes to where somebody's supposed to be walking, but they're moving forward. It's like, Spike, do you have to do that? We, we know it's your movie. We know it's you. Please. <laughs> but everybody, every director has their zhuzh. Um, overall, I think it was a really good film. Once again, reiterating that I knew this movie was rated R, I knew it was a war film, but wow, I did not expect to see certain images or certain things. It does bring light to people who are unaware of the, the, the vast contributions that black soldiers uh, did in World War II, Vietnam, and to only come back to America and not to be treated like the citizens that they are. Uh, very heartbreaking. It's graphic. So let me know what you think of the film or if you saw it. And if not, this next part is a spoiler alert. In this next section, I will go and explain the movie in its entirety, the characters, the plot, everything almost kind of verbatim, scene for scene per se, to give you the, the key points of the movie all the way until the end. And that's all coming up next. I hope that you enjoy and make sure to subscribe. It's all coming up next. The recap of The Five Bloods directed by Spike Lee. As the movie begins, we are introduced to four vets who've returned to Vietnam in order to find their fallen soldier that served in their platoon named Stormin Norman, played by Chadwick Boseman. So the original five are Paul, played by Delroy Lindo, Eddie, played by Norm Lewis, Otis, played by Clark Peters, and Melvin, played by Isaiah Whitlock. After some time of partying and getting a chance to relax, the gentlemen meet up with a guide that's in Vietnam. And the guide wants to know, what are you looking for specifically? And there's only so far I can go. So what is it exactly that you guys are looking for? I, You told me that you're looking for a fallen soldier, but of course, you know, I have to have the proper documentation giving you this permission. So they show them all of the confirmed documentation that they need to make this search. They have permission from the U.S. government and they have permission from the Vietnam government. The guide looks at all of the documentation and he says, hey, I can get you to a certain point, but I can't go any further to risk my life because certain areas are very dangerous. After they meet with them, Otis says that I have to go somewhere really important and I got some things to do. Otis goes to see a woman by the name of Tian and they're discussing memories and how her cooking is great and she's just really flattered that he loves her cooking and as they're speaking she's saying what we're doing is a very risky situation. The gold belongs to the Vietnamese government and the conversion of this gold is risky so we have to be safe. And he asked her, hey, can I trust this connect that you have to do this conversion of this currency? Because we can't get on a plane with bars of gold. So we do realize that from the trailer, there are bars of gold that they are trying to retrieve and not just Norm's body to take back to the States. As they're talking, we do see a young lady that appears to be of african-american descent and asian descent and from their conversation you can tell that there was love in the past and still currently love between them and when she leaves the room otis asks her is that my daughter and he sees his face in hers and she tells him that yes that's your daughter and I couldn't do anything after that because where I'm from, not only does my child not have a father, but I couldn't even get a job. I was looked at as the scum of the earth trash. I couldn't even get a job scrubbing toilets. So if I would have revealed the information about my child, there's no telling what would have happened to me. 
The next day, the remaining four go with Tian to meet this connect, this same person that can do the currency change from gold to money that they can put in a Swiss account. They can It can be accessed anywhere in the world. They meet with him and he is a Frenchman and he's asking them, you're telling me this story that the government, the U.S. government wants you, you to retrieve this body and this gold. And how do I know this is even true? And what exactly am I doing? Because just like how you don't trust me, I don't trust you. And Otis explains that their platoon had an assignment to retrieve a fallen CIA plane that went down that had a specific payroll for the native people. They didn't want paper currency and they wanted gold. So Uncle Sam paid them in gold for their help against the VC. So if you think about the dynamic of what's happening, they have told the guide that they are looking for a body. But on the side, they are working with Tion and this other connect, this Frenchman, to look for gold. They know that they're looking for gold. There's a flashback clip of the original five. They find that gold and they discuss with one another and saying, hey, who are we to return this back? We should bury this gold now and come back for it later. And this gold, gold belongs to us. It belongs to us more than anything because we're going to go back and we're still going to be treated a certain way. So let's make this agreement that we'll all five return, find this gold and claim it for ourselves. But of course, the remaining remaining four vets, they're not sharing that bit of information, of course, with everybody else. But Otis goes on to explain that they went back, their platoon went back to find it. And what we know so far is that that location has changed because that area was napalmed and destroyed their landmarks that they left, reminding them that there must have been some type of change with the original case from mudslides. So it's probably the gold is probably scattered scattered amongst the area by now. Otis further explains that the only thing that's helping them with an accurate location or an estimate location are satellite photos from the U.S. government that spotted the tail of that plane. Paul asked the Frenchman, hey, you know, you asking all of us these questions, how do we know that we can trust you? And he says, well, I guess we'll just have to trust each other. You guys just get started on your end and I'll start the ball rolling on the things that I need to do. When Paul gets back to his room, he sees someone already in there. And then we're introduced to the character David, played by Jonathan Majors. And we learn that David is Paul's son. Paul is just like, you know, what are you doing here? And he says, Dad, you know, I, I followed you. You said you were coming back here. And I know that you have issues. You got this trauma. And I wanted to make sure that you weren't doing anything too crazy. And Paul says, you know, I just came here, you know, with my friends and we're just reminiscing. And he's like, you came back to Vietnam to re reminisce about war. I I'm not believing that. And I already know why y'all are really here. Y'all are here for the gold. gold. And Paul is just kind of taken back like, man, you know, how did he figure this out? And he says, I looked through your emails because I was checking up on you. And then I see some information about gold. So since you guys are doing this and to keep my mouth closed, I want to cut. And Paul is saying, man, you know what? You got some nerve. I've taken care of you your whole life and you got the nerve to be greedy and ask me for some gold. And he says, it's the least that you can give me seeing how you really treated me so badly growing up and you really haven't been the best father. And Paul, without consulting anybody else, says, well, I guess you'll get a cut, but don't tell anybody else that you know about the gold. We see the group continue and they're starting their journey to get to a driving point. And Otis says to David, you know, why are you here? It's interesting that you're here. And he's telling them, hey, look, I'm just keeping an eye on my dad. I just felt something wasn't right. And you know, he suffers from trauma. You know, he has PTSD. And Otis is just like, okay, I was just wondering. It just seemed odd that you just popped up. They reach another stop point in order to change clothes and gather their thoughts before they go any further. And David and everyone else goes down to get a few drinks and he meets someone that's a French woman. And she starts to ask all of these questions like, oh, you guys are American. You know, what are you doing in Vietnam? So it seems kind of suspicious. And he wants to know, you know, why she's asking so many questions. She says she's just starting small talk. And he explains that we're here to find, you know, something 
my father is a Vietnam vet and the men that are with him also served with him in a specific platoon. And right now we're just trying to take a breather and rest. And since you're asking me all these questions, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? And she explains that she's with an organization that volunteers to find landmines because children step on them and people get killed from something that was left years ago. She also goes to explain that her family exploited Vietnam families and they made a profit off of it. And she feels that whatever she can do to give back, to make things right, it gives her peace. The guide gets them to a specific area and he tells them to be safe as they pack up and he lets them know that, hey, I can't go any further, but I want to let you know that I will return back at that specific day and time that you requested in order to get you guys back and to get you back home safely. He rich, you know, wishes them guys speed and they take off. As they make their journey on, we do see flashbacks of different things that they experienced while in Vietnam. So they've been walking and they've been voyaging for a while, looking for an estimate of the location of the gold. And David says, you know, I got to take a break. I got to use the restroom. So he takes the shovel somewhere, goes off to the side to dig a hole. As he's digging the hole, the shovel hits something and he digs and he finds a gold bar. And he's telling everybody, hey, I think I found something. I think I found something. Y'all come over here. I found some gold and there's a bar of gold. And everybody's just like, oh, you know, it's great. We're in the area. We've got to find it. So they keep going and they dig and they dig and they dig and they find the original case that the gold was in, but it's empty. And they tell each other, yeah, you know, our estimates were correct. It's obvious that we're finding gold bars here and there, but this case is empty. That confirms that because of those mudslides, it's probably scattered all down this hill. So they keep digging and they find gold bar after gold bar after gold bar. And before they know it, they have this huge amount of golden bars. Otis says, okay, let me do the math. That's 45,000 per bar. So what we've collected so far, that's $17 million. And as the viewer, we can see, unfortunately, as they're celebrating, they are being watched. They keep moving forward and keep moving forward using the metal detector. And they say, man, you know, we keep finding more gold bars. So they dig and they dig and they dig. Only this time, what they find isn't gold at all. They see a dog tag. And when they read it, it is Norman's body. They're all overwhelmed. They're starting to cry. And they're saying, hey, we got to get our brother home. And they are just overwhelmed by everything and just his memories and what he wanted. And we learn that Norman was that soldier that kept everybody glued together, kept everybody inspired. He would tell them a black, about black history. And at the time, it wasn't even popular to learn about your own people. So they say a prayer. They have their moments of silence and remembrance, but they tell each other, hey, we got to keep pushing forward. We can't stay here. We got to keep moving. They are continuing to move forward, but now their walking is slower because they're carrying heavy gold bars. They are tired. They are more fatigued. They're thirstier. They're trying to conserve their water. And they get in these deep conversations talking about money, what they're going to do about it when they get back. And Eddie is saying, hey, man, you know, this money that we're getting and we're taking back with our cuts, we need to give this back to our people. And Paul is just like, well, that's what you can do with your cut. I mean, you can't tell me what to do with my money. And if you want to give back, you should give back. And Eddie's just like, yeah, man, you know, these kids, man, they're doing so much for the people. And we got to give back to the people. You know, when I get back, you know, of course, I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to take care of my family. But number one thing that I want to do is I want to give it back to a cause, man. I really want to give it back to these kids. And I really want it. As he's saying, he's backing up further and further. And before we know it, he steps on a landmine and we see this big explosion and everybody is shocked and Otis is screaming that this can't be real this can't be real and as he's looking at him his arms his is from his waist down his arms and from the waist down everything is gone and Eddie is saying no this can't be how I die this can't be how I die and everybody is just crying and just can't believe it and David 
haven't been in any war at all. He is just dumbfounded on what he just saw. And there's nothing that he can, they can do. There's nothing they can do to take him home. They try to console him and saying that everything will be okay. We're going to get help. But they know from experience that it's just too late. There's, there's nothing that, that they can do. In the midst of this happening, David, he's just like, I can't. This is just too much. I need to walk away and take a break. And he's trying to breathe. And all of a sudden, we hear click. And Paul says, David, son, don't move. Don't shift your weight. Don't even think about moving. Just be still. You stepped on it. It's a landmine, but it's not an automatic one. So just... Just stay still. Listen to me. And as Paul is trying to talk to David, they hear footsteps in the background. They're being approached. And he pulls out his weapon. And we see it's the same individuals that David saw at the bar. The Frenchman and two of her other colleagues that are from the research group that looks at landmines and getting them removed from those areas. And like, hey, man, put the gun down. It's okay. And Paul is like, no, nah, man, how did you know we were here? He was like, our, our camp is right up this hill. We don't want to harm you. We can actually help. Let us use our metal detector to see if there's anything we can do. And Paul is just like, how do you know that's going to work? How do you know that he's going to be okay? And he's like, the only way we that we can know is if he steps off of the mine. We, we don't know, but let me just look at it. Let me see if there's any way that I can help. And one gentleman goes over with his detector and he says, I can't tell if this is a dud or if this is a real thing. So now they're panicking. Now they're trying to think of ways to, to, to get him off of this. If he moves, he, he can die. And if he stays there, it's just it's just this curiosity of will he die? Uh, what can we do? So it's just this press for time and this confusion. And there's such great suspense in this scene but then Paul says hey y'all remember y'all remember in the war you remember the little country kid that was from Oklahoma and this same thing happened you remember and we had a rope and we, and we just pulled them off y'all remember that and they're like yeah 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 we remember that we remember that and gladly one of them has a rope and he's like look son I gotta tell you what I need you to do now okay stay calm I'm gonna need you to get this rope and wrap it around yourself twice, real tight. But don't shift your weight, okay? Just don't shift your weight, real weight. And David, you know, he's crying. He's like, look, look, look. You're a Morehouse man, right? Think think about how you, how you got to stay focused, okay? And he's telling everybody else, okay, look. We got to get a good distance apart. And we got to wrap it around our arms. And we got to we gotta pull him off of this. But the only way is we got to be in unison. We got to pull. I mean, you guys got to pull from your soul and just pull like you, like you just pull in anything, your dream, your destiny at the end. And we got to be in unison and we got to pull. And he says, David, I want you to fly. When you feel us pulling, just fly, leap and jump as fast as you can. You hear me? And David tells him, yes, yes, I'll do it. So they all get ready. And Paul says, everybody listen. We're going to count down. And when I count down, I need everybody to pull with every inch that you had with all your might. Everybody get ready. Okay. Three. Two. One. And they pull him and there's this explosion. And he pulls his son with all of his might. And he's crying this wailing cry as if he's just so happy. You would think that David was just born and they hold each other and there's this whimpering cry like you would never have thought you'd heard a, a father to cry for his child. But before they can even go on to celebrate anymore, Paul pulls out a gun and he tells everybody, hey, we got to tie them up. Because now everything is compromised. Now they know about the gold. And they're telling him, look, we're on our research mission. We could care less what you guys are doing. Just leave us alone and just just, just, just let us go. And he's like, no, 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 no. We're going to tie you up. And Otis is just like, what are you thinking? Have you lost your mind? Like, no, they, they, they don't want to harm us. And he's telling them, you either tie them up or you're going to have a problem with me. 
they start to bury Norman and Paul says now he's buried and we're going to make sure Eddie's family gets his cut and David gets a cut since he's helping us. And Paul has a legitimate argument to tie up these researchers because we really can't trust anyone at this point. But his behavior lets everybody know that he's slowly snapping because he's saying over and over again, I'm that mother effer. I'm that mother effer. And I got the gun. And it's this, oh, no. Uh oh. <laughs> what's what's going on? Everybody convinces Paul, like, hey, you don't have to tie them up, you know, while we're walking. Instead, you know, we can keep an eye on them. So that's what they do. They put the researchers in the middle as they continue to make their journey. And we got they got some in the front and some in the back so they can keep an eye on them. By the time night comes, they tie them back up as a group so they don't run off. So everybody can keep an eye on them. Now, Paul doesn't trust Otis because he feel he feels he has a deal with Tion that supplied them with the connect and he doesn't trust her. The French woman knows that David has a soft spot and he's really nice and he doesn't act like everybody else. So she tells him, hey, I really got to use the restroom. Can you untie me? And he unties her. And as she's using the restroom, she's telling him, you know, you're not like everybody else. I knew that you were sweet when I saw you in the bar. I know that you didn't have cruel intentions. And as she gets up, she says, why don't you just let me go? Let me go and let me get a 10 minute start. But Paul walks up and he's not having it. He's telling David, you, you're softy. You're not made for this. Make sure that you tie her back up. Otis finds a way to knock out Paul and to get him down because he feels that he's losing it. And they tie him up so he can calm down until the next day. We then see that the guide is there the next day waiting for them to return. But he notices that the men look absolutely worn out and Eddie is missing and they have additional people with them. They lie and say that Eddie broke his ankle, but they left him food and water for him to come back and he's just fine. And the tour guide says, well, you know, I can call for help because he feels that something isn't right. He's getting eye contact with those researchers and Otis says no 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 how'd you like to earn a lot of money I mean more money than you've seen in your entire life and as he's saying that a group of people come up and they pull up with one of the gentlemen that escaped as a researcher and they're saying you have gold and we want it back and we'll kill your friend if you don't agree to give it to us, that money belongs to us. And Paul says, you know, that's BS. That that gold belongs to the U.S. And they used it for a service. That service wasn't fulfilled. And we want it back. And there is a small fight between the researchers and this group of men that live in that area. During the fight, you have one of the researchers that steps on a line, landmine and dies. David is shot in the leg and several of the Vietnamese men are shot and killed. It's a very graphic scene. Gladly, David's wound is an in and out shot and Otis confirms that he'll be okay and everyone in the research group is in shock. And the guide notices that the gasoline is pouring out. And he says that we're not going to get far on this gasoline that we have left. And Otis says, you know, we got to get out of here. And Paul says, yeah, we got to get out of here because those guys are going to go back to their town and they're going to come back to get more people and they're going to kill us. And Otis says, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Let me call 10 to get us out of here. And Paul says, no, 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 no. I still don't trust her and I still don't trust you. And it looks like we're going to have to make this hike up this way to go to the next city and the researcher is saying that's like 25 miles away from here what are you talking about and everybody tells Paul that he's losing his mind and just to calm down he says no 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 I'm gonna take what I want with me to this town and Otis is saying how can we lift and carry David this far like we can't hike 25 miles with him and his leg and Paul says I'm gonna do what I want with my cut and he's not my problem anymore and they're like, oh, come on, man. This is your son. What are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 no. He's not my problem anymore. And he goes on into this rant and he is just hysterically singing and laughing. And all his friends can do is just helplessly watch as he walks away. The guide says, hey, man. I can help you get out of here and I can help you get that gold and that money out of the country. 
And now the researchers say, hey, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I'll help you. But now we want to cut. And Otis can't help but to agree because there's no other way in there. They have no other choice but to get out. And Melvin is just like, well, dang, why don't you just put the gold on Craigslist? <laughs> and they get in the truck and they start to leave and go as far as they can. As Paul predicted, some guys come back only to see that the truck is gone and there is somebody else on foot. So they say, hey, we all got to get this person on foot because it's kind of hard for us to track the truck. But let's just split up. And as they split up, Paul continues to walk and rant. And there's this long monologue about he how he talks about the country and how the country screwed over black people. He makes valid points, but it's obvious that he's just slowly snapping as he's walking and as he's walking he's bitten by a snake and he shoots the snake and he gets away and as he's falling the bag with all the gold in it is on the higher point of the hill and now he can't get it after the truck stops everybody else is still journeying on and they're carrying david on their shoulders and they're getting the guide is getting them to a safe place where they could collect themselves and wait until more help arrives paul is starting to halluc hallucinate and he sees norm in a vision and he thinks it's time for him to die but norman says no 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 you can't come with me until you come clean and he unveils a bullet wound in his stomach there's a flashback scene back to the location of the crashed plane. And we learn that while in combat, Paul accidentally shoots Norman while shooting at the enemy soldier. But in present time, we come back in Paul's vision of Norman. Norman says, it was an accident and I forgive you. And we finally see why Paul has such so much trauma and he's such a manic depressant because he's having night terrors and seeing Norman because he's so guilty that he kills him but then Norman says it was an accident I forgive you it's okay by this time the other gunmen have caught up with Paul and they're asking him and they're demanding where's everybody else and where's your cut of the gold where's the rest of the gold and Paul is just he's he's hallucinating from the snake bite and he's just deranged and he's singing he's like I'll never tell where they are and you know he's singing Marvin Gaye and he's singing all of these songs and they're telling him hey we're making you you bury yourself you're digging your own grave you need to tell us and he's still singing and they eventually kill Paul so the others they're keeping their eyes open because they're looking for the connect to come get them and the guy says hey if I die here's something to to give to this address just in case I die and they see their connect arrive and the audience notices that the Frenchman puts on the same hat that one of the Viet Vietnamese soldiers put on his head after killing Paul. So the woman speaks to him in French, thinking that that would keep everything calm and says, hey, these men are a part of our history and this gold and, every, gold and everything that's been going on belongs to them. But the Frenchman says, you know, they made a sacrifice and so did I. And just because they're black doesn't make them any better. And Otis wants to know, hey, what are you, what are you guys talking about? And the Frenchman tells him, you know, we're, we're, we're discussing business. And Otis puts two and two together and says, hey, what you're about to do? Did Tian have anything to do with this plan? And he confirms that she had no part and she has no idea what they're about to do. And he says that she's just as dumb as you are. And he instructs them. Otis says, hey, look, just take the gun. Just take the gold. Leave us alone and just just go. And as the gunmen are going through the bag, they realize that it's not full of gold, but instead it's full of rocks. And they realize that something isn't right. And there is this big shootout instead. The guide is shot in the arm, but Otis says that it's an in and out shot. Melvin dies because he lays on a grenade to help save everyone and Otis is shot in the shoulder David is able to take a shot and kill the crooked connect David reads a letter later on in the scene that his dad wanted him to know that he hadn't been the best father he's sorry and he wants him to be great and he just apologized for just being such a terrible person to him 
So that lets us know that they made it home okay because David is reading this letter that Paul left for him. And then we see a montage of several shots. We see that Melvin's family gets a check for $2 million. And it's his part, it's his share. We also see that Eddie's cut goes to the Black Lives Matter movement and they're happy that they have a donation to further their cause. The two remaining researchers they get their cut and also one of the researchers that died in the landmine and they continue and they donate all of their money to keep going with the supplies and helping that village with discovering landmines and getting rid of them. Norman's family um, gets peace when his body finally returns back home for a proper burial and Otis finally meets his daughter face to face and she says father and they finally get to meet each other and in closing before the movie ends we do hear an excerpt of Martin Luther King's speech about how black people must be treated equally in America and no matter what we do it never seems to be enough and one day black people will be free and that is the end of the movie. I hope that you liked this recap. It was a lot of details within the movie and I summarized to the best of my ability and made it to where you could understand um, as best as I could. And let me know what you thought of this movie. I cannot wait to read your comments. Until next time, be safe. I love you guys. Be precautious of COVID-19, but not fearful. Until next time, bye.